This week, I'll be traveling millions of years back in time underground in Oman. I'm starting to work up a bit of a sweat here. <laughs> We're hitting the water in New York City. Plus, we're booking a table at the world's oldest restaurant. First up, this week we're in New York. It's a frenzy of people and traffic and everything here, from the skyscrapers to the food, is gigantic. But what most people don't know is that if you're lucky, you might also be able to spot some of the biggest creatures on Earth. Joe Worley's taken to the waters there to find out more. This is Rockaway Bay. It's a 40-minute cab ride from Times Square and one of the jumping-off points for reaching the waters of the New York Bight. Speeding through the bay gives you a great view of the city's skyline. But I'm interested in what's under the water. Whales. In the past five years, there's been a surge in the number seen near the city. It's thought they've come here because the water quality has improved, which means there's more bait. But catching a glimpse of one can be tricky. Seven different species have been spotted in these waters around New York, including the enormous blue whale. They say that today we're most likely to see a humpback whale. Fingers crossed. This is the exact spot where we left the whale yesterday. And Artie's part of a network of whale trackers. What's really nuts is that Manhattan has how many millions of people? And like I talk to people all the time, they don't even know that there are humpback whales, like literally 16 miles from the, from the Empire State Building. Artie has taken some truly amazing photos that show just how close the whales come to the city. But his main focus is to get a clear shot of the bottom of the tail, called a fluke. That fluke is a fingerprint, and there's not one of them are the same. That's how you ID a whale. So there's some that are black, there's some that are white, speckled. We have a New York City uh, catalog of whales, and I think this morning we're up to 51. My mission today is to try and get some shots to add to the catalog. And what's your top tip for taking a photo of a whale? <laughs> you gotta be ready. You just gotta be ready. You gotta, you gotta always have that camera up, you know, and, and just have the settings right, have, the, have everything perfect. So you got it's you got like this the whole day. I really want to see you. Oh, one. you're going to see a whale. It's going to be great. I can't, I'm, I'm excited for you. We're scouring the horizon for a puff of water called a whale blow. It's a rough, windy day, so it's hard to tell whether what I'm seeing is a whale or just the break of a wave. But then... People are pointing that way? Yeah. yeah. Ah, ah. There's a lot of excitement on the boat because someone's just spotted a whale. Oh, where? 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 Yeah. Let's see, come on. There's the dorsal. This wasn't here. Oh, where? There he is. Nah, no, okay. <gasps> yeah, yeah, run over there. <gasps> you can go over there. Catching a glimpse of a whale is so exciting. You were ready on that one. <laughs> That's two! There's two! Yeah. See another one? Oh, but we still haven't managed to get that all-important fluke shot. Now that's the blow that holds on for a while. Whoa! Oh. 
Come on, baby. So oh, now, now you see he's gonna show his food now. Oh no, didn't show. Get that tail. Get that tail. I love it. We don't see this stuff. We don't see this. This is great. <laughs> yeah, he's feeding. Woo! Yeah, same one as before. This really is incredible, but it's so tricky to get a shot of the whale. The tail comes up for just a few seconds, and then a moment later, it'll be about 200 meters away. Whoa! You are good. You're ready. She's ready. There's the blow. And here's the fluke, I, we saw this one yesterday. <laughs> That's nice. Yep, this is the shot. That's what you want. And that's the money shot. That's the shot right there that says who this whale is. It's, it, it's its identity, it's like a, a fingerprint. Photos like this help researchers understand the whale's behavior and rough location. Up oh, there he is. But it is a tiny part of the picture, as most of the action happens under the water. This is cool. But now new technology is being trialled by scientists at the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. They've installed powerful underwater microphones below a buoy 22 miles south off the coast of New York to try and find out which whales are in the area. Beautiful. This is a fin whale, second largest animal on the planet. Dr. Rosenbaum shows me what they're listening for. Wow. So that sound hits the buoy and feeds back um, like a sheet of music. Yeah. Gets sent up through the hoses over the satellite link mm -hmm. to a server where it makes, you know, the, the computer generated software will make that detection of, ah, I see that that, that pattern, which is like the notes, uh, you know, the sheet music and say that's, that is a fin whale. Then it's checked by an analyst and then posted on the website. You can actually get to the latest data. There's a map of where the boy is located. And there really are a lot of hits there, aren't there? You see in the fin whales so frequently. Yeah, so what you can do is actually, you can actually go on any one day. This was um, just yesterday. And you can see throughout the, almost the entire day from three in the morning till, you know, almost eight o'clock at night, there were fin whales vocalizing. And it would have been that bloop, bloop, bloop yep. sound. Yeah. Since the buoy was deployed in June, whale vocalizations have been recorded almost every day, and it's hoped the information can be used to protect these huge mammals from colliding with boats. New York has some of the world's busiest shipping lanes. Increasingly, whales are using this habitat as we're seeing, and we know that whales show signs of getting hit by ships, there are scars that they have, and in the last few years, a number of whales have actually gotten hit by ships um, and, and have been floating dead in New York waters. Whether where they were hit, we're not exactly sure, but it is a concern, and there are technologies like the buoy that we can use to help minimize the risk of whales getting hit by ships. And tourists can get involved with the conservation too, submitting the photos they've taken to whale watching networks. And we've had a lot of people that have gone whale watching all over the world and have seen more whales here in New York than they've seen on, on places like Alaska and the Mediterranean. He's going, almost a fluke. New York right now is the new Cape Cod of whale watching. In the 70s and 80s, the whales were in Cape Cod. There weren't many here. Now there's probably as many here as in Cape Cod. If you'd like to try and spot a whale near the city, trips run from May to November. Security call, American Princess, Limbound, Manhattan, Rockaway. And you can keep up with the whales in real time on the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution website. Up next, we've got more from our Global Gourmet series. 
this week we're in Madrid at what's thought to be the world's oldest restaurant. I am Antonio Gonzalez and this is uh, Botin. This is the oldest restaurant continuously operating in the world. This is a little part of the history, a little corner of the history of the old Madrid. The first room, I mean, it's downstairs, it's a 16th century dining room. It's the only room left from an old inn that was here at least in 1580. Ernest Hemingway. He was a, a very regular customer here and the, included Botin in the last uh, action of one of his books, The Sun of Surprises. If you read it, the last action of the book takes place upstairs in one of our dining rooms. He used to try to cook his own dishes, especially the paella. And my grandfather, and he told him to, to keep on writing, and he will keep on cooking. We try to, to keep the ambience of a museum, restaurant, well, focused on, on the quality of food, of course. Our food is not uh, sophisticated. It's traditional Spanish flavors, traditional Spanish cooking, regional cooking. But basically, we are focused in roast, or in the original oven from 1725. We have roast suckling pig and roast baby lamb as the main specialty. It's uh, very simple. It's with a little of white wine, uh, a shorted of uh, garlic, onion, and rosmarino, and a little of red pepper. And that's all. It's very simple. Two and a half hours, uh, and you get it. When you belong to a family business related with a restaurant, you finally have a sentimental relation with it. It's like a human being. You have a very close relation. This is a little part of the history of Madrid. You collect moments of your life in these walls and in these corners, and, and everything that happens here is uh, affected. <laughs> you succeed, you're very happy. You fail, you're a disaster. Still to come on The Travel Show, I'm heading deep underground in Oman in search of a rare fish that lives in total darkness. It's like a proper training workout. <laughs> oh, no, how? The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. <laughs> Hello, I'm Michelle Yana Chan, your global guide, with top tips on the world's best events in the coming month. Starting in Scotland, it's the Up Heli R Festival in Lerwick on January 31st, which celebrates the Viking heritage of the Shetland Islands. The fiery festival, which began more than 100 years ago, celebrates the Scandinavian influence in the region. Up to the Alps, in Switzerland on January 21st, dozens of hot air balloons will take to the skies above Chateau d'Air for the Festival International de Ballon. There'll be aerobatic shows, sky chariots, and cloud hoppers, which are single-seater balloons to you and me, as well as airships, wingsuit displays, and remote-controlled hot air ballooning, all with a backdrop of the snowy Swiss Alps. The festival ends on January 29th. Across in the American Rockies, the snow will be centre stage at the International Snow Sculpture Championships in Breckenridge, Colorado. From January 24th to 28th, it's Sculpting Week, followed immediately by Viewing Week. Snow artists from around the world come here to compete, each team taking on 12-foot tall, 20-plus-ton blocks of snow and carving and chiselling by hand 
some of the most extraordinary works of art. No power tools are used. There are also no internal support structures. Tools of the trade range from vegetable peelers to chicken wire to small saws. Watch the snow take shape. It'll be a very different kind of art at the Perth International Arts Festival, which plays out for nearly a month, starting February 10th. A thousand contemporary artists will be in action in theatre, music, film and literature, performing at venues and outdoor spaces across the Western Australian capital. On the island of Jeju in South Korea, the Jongwol Daeburim Fire Festival takes place March 2nd through 5th, celebrating the first full moon of the lunar calendar. In the Italian Dolomites, it's the much longer on January 29th, or the Long March, one of the world's toughest cross-country ski races. Starting in Moana and finishing in Cavalese, the race covers 70 kilometers of track. Thousands of pros and amateurs compete through the sensational Fasse and Fiemme Valleys, flanked by the towering peaks of arguably the most beautiful mountains in the world. Finally, melt into the week-long Lantern Festival in Taiwan, which begins February 11th on the back of Chinese New Year celebrations. There'll be the sound of firecrackers, parades of oversized turtle effigies out in the archipelago of Penghu, the release of sky lanterns in the district of Pingxi, and fairy tale displays in the town of Taoyuan. That's my global guide this month. Let me know what's happening in the place where you live or where you love. We're on email and across social media. Until next time, happy traveling. And to end this week, I'm going back two million years in time here in Oman and visiting the country's famous Al Huta caves, which have recently reopened to tourists. I'm taking a two hour drive from the capital Muscat to Jabal Shams, which is Oman's most iconic mountain and home to the world famous Al Huta Caves. There are five kilometer long series of caverns and passages formed over a million years before the first humans appeared on Earth. Once you arrive at the foot of the mountain, you take a short tram ride through the blistering midday heat and into the mouth of the cave system. So this stunning entrance is the opening to the Al Huta Caves. It's two to three million years old. It's just so beautiful and I'm in search of the famous blind pink fish, which you can only find here. The fish have survived undisturbed here beneath the earth in total darkness until one day about 100 years ago when the caves were discovered totally by accident. Discovered this is by a uh, goat shepherd mm -hmm. when his goat uh, fell down from uh, the fence and come down here. At that time he comes here and discovered this is the cave. That's an incredible story. Yeah. <laughs> his goat f fell through this hole yeah, and suddenly yeah. discovered <laughs> these caves. Once inside, you can explore the caves by using the specially constructed walkways and take your journey back in time. I'm starting to work up a bit of a sweat here. <laughs> Despite Oman being arid most of the year, the country is pockmarked with riverbeds which can flood very quickly when it rains. And flash flooding back in 2014 sent water gushing into the caves, submerging most of them and closing the complex down to tourists. Just over two years on, and the water has been pumped out, returning the caves to their former glory. I could stare at these rocks for ages and sometimes it feels like your mind's playing tricks on you. Down there I saw uh, what looked like a, a man's face that had been carved out of the rocks. And you've got a lot of this opening is man-made created, but some of this is natural, like that looks like a lion's head. I swear it looks like a lion's head. You can see its mane, there's a bit of its mouth over there. <laughs> it's bizarre. As you venture deeper and deeper into the caves, the walkways get longer and the stairs get steeper. Look at that. But after coming all this way, 
I'm determined to see as much as I can, especially those pink blind fish that I'm told can only be found here. Yeah, this is like being back at my mum and dad's old council flat. You've got to be pretty able to get around this cave. There it is. Sadly though, it doesn't look like I'm really cut out to be a caveman. It's like a proper training workout. <laughs> oh, no, how? Look over there. It's just stairs, flights and flights of stairs. I think um, my cave dwelling is over now. This is enough for me. Such a shame, because this cave is starting to get so beautiful. While I caught my breath, the crew ventured further into the cave. And at last, they discovered what we'd all hoped to see, the rare pink blind fish. Coloured a translucent pink, it's mind-blowing to think that they've been here for millions and millions of years, undiscovered, until the day that goat accidentally stumbled upon this massive cave system. At the moment, you can only explore about 10% of the Al Huta caves, but it's hoped in the future, more of its underground secrets will be revealed to the public. I loved those caves, they were absolutely awesome. Well, sadly, that's it for this week, but coming up next week... Henry's also heading underground, this time in Cappadocia, in southern Turkey, where a city thousands of years old is being unearthed. Wow. Look at that. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media and all the details are on the bottom of your screens right now. But for now, from me, Adia Depitan, and all the Travel Show team here in Oman, it's bye-bye.